across the street from us that doesn't pay a lot of attention. Next thing you know, he's stuck out there in that bank. And <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the January 13th uh, snowy meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, also, uh, happy uh, Valentine's Day to everybody for tomorrow. I'm Rob Parrish. Uh, I'm sitting in for our chair. Wendy McClure, who couldn't be with us tonight. And before we get started, a couple of um, items. Um, Kurt Obermeyer, who has been a longtime uh, Planning and Zoning Commissioner, uh, this was going to be his last meeting. Uh, apparently, the last meeting was his last meeting. Kurt is <laughs> moving uh, to Arizona. We're going to miss him uh, greatly, and we just wanted to thank him for all his years of uh, of service to the community so uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to to say goodbye to him later uh, this evening uh, another thing I'd like to ask Nels to give us a report another commission commission member uh, Joel Hamilton has been uh, out ill uh, with some surgery and Nels has a report yeah, just uh, talked to Joel this afternoon he is alive uh, he's a little shaky uh, it uh, it was a heart issue that he had, and it turned out to be a bit more serious than we thought it was going to be when they got in there, apparently. So uh, he was in the hospital. I guess it was like an 11-hour operation, which is uh, pretty startling. And uh, but he's back home again, and. Uh, accepting nourishment and took a walk today uh, Fantastic. uh walked a few feet anyway and is uh i think uh, on the mend so it's uh, nice to know that uh, i had a it turned out he had a mitral valve issue as well so there were more things going on in there and i've i've been through that myself so lots of us have had a um, an event of the heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad that <laughs> and, he's uh, progressing. Uh, anyway, it sounds like he's uh, on his way back. Super. Thanks, Nels. Appreciate that. And Joel, if you're watching, uh, get well soon. We miss you, and we uh, hope to see you back here uh, as soon as possible. So with that, uh, we'll move to the uh, approval of the minutes from January 23rd. Uh, any additions, deletions, corrections? We're good. Oops. Sorry, <laughs> Siri thinks that I'm uh, <laughs> in my pocket. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Personal <laughs> assistant. Technology just, uh, <laughs> now my pocket's going to start talking. Uh, so I would entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Victoria? Second. Second from Mike. Uh, all, okay, any other? No, oh, okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Okay, approved. Thank you very much. Uh, public comment period uh, for anybody that would like to uh, have uh, a few minutes to <coughs> speak to the uh, Planning and Zoning Com uh, Commission as long as it is not about a subject that is on the agenda tonight or before the Board of Adjustment or before City Council. So I don't see anybody. So we always uh, welcome uh, folks to come on down. So. Uh, it's, it's hard to hear you over the TV. So third, uh, third item on the agenda is a review of the six month stay limitation for recreational vehicles. Mike? Yeah, thank you. So this was an item that, uh, if you recall, I think it was the first meeting in uh, January we discussed. Um, got a, a request from uh, Mr. Gary Lester who's in with us tonight. Uh, regarding the uh, six-month limitation on RVs in uh, in town, so <laughs> went through a presentation at that point. You know, maybe some of you forgot or weren't here, so I'll just quickly just run through um, kind of a, a background as what what's occurred up to this point. But if you recall, you know, August of last year, uh, we approved um, an RV space proposal within Avial Mobile Home Park, uh, which was at 603 West Palouse River Drive. So there was numerous uh, sites within that park. Uh, they were a little bit too small to accommodate larger mobile homes. Um, you know, mobile homes have kind of grown in size over the years, and uh, there was just spaces within that park, mainly the Eastern Loop, uh, that had fairly small spaces that would, wouldn't accommodate 
uh, newer RV or newer mobile homes. And so um, Mr. Lester requested that uh, some RV spaces be intermingled in the mobile home park. Uh, and that was approved by the commission. Um, and there were some spaces that were dedicated uh, permanently as RVs in there. And those were just mainly those uh, spaces that were just too small to accommodate mobile homes. Uh, and then some other spaces where he was having trouble filling those with mobile homes and just wanted the flexibility of uh, having RVs in there in the interim uh, and maybe transitioning those out in three to five years just because uh, a little more lucrative to have mobile homes than RVs in the park uh, is what I recall at the time. So this was the park, um, Palouse River Drive here to the north and then there's two, you know, mainly two loops, uh, one here and one here. You can tell this loop was quite a bit smaller as far as some of these spaces that you see in the aerial um, in order to accommodate a mobile home. Uh, this was the map that he had submitted at the time just showing uh, the spaces that he wanted designated as RV spaces and those spaces were the kind of a darker highlight highlighted uh, areas there. So we received a, a letter like I mentioned I uh, wanted just wanting to explore removing the six month limitation uh, for RVs. Uh, so right now our code says that uh, persons occupying vehicles with total hookups including sewer water electricity should not occupy RV park space uh, for a period exceeding 180 days uh, within a 12 month period uh, nor shall the cumulative occupancy by such persons of different RV spaces anywhere in the facility exceed a total of 180 days in any 12 month period. So you know, essentially they'd have to move to another RV park um, we really don't have any other RV parks except for the, uh, the Lions Club RV park at the fairgrounds, uh, which only has a, a few spaces over in that uh, park. Uh, the only, I think the closest one would be Dan Max Rambler RV park on Troy Highway, east of town. So looking at uh, kind of the existing definitions, you know, a recreational vehicle, uh, a vehicle type unit previously designed as temporary living quarters, for recreational, camping, travel use, uh, which either has its own motor power, is mounted on or drawn to another vehicle. Uh, basic entities are camp trailer, motor home, travel trailer, fifth wheel, truck camper. Um, and so we have kind of different definitions of those different types of RVs. So camp trailer, um, vehicular portable unit mounted on wheels, constructed of collapsible partial sidewalls, which fold, towing kind of a pop-up type trailer. Um, motor home, you know, has a uh, pretty much a motor uh, designed to provide temporary living quarters, recreational camping, travel use, built on permanently attached or self-propelled motor, vehicle chassis, cab, or van, uh, which is an integral part of the completed vehicle. Travel trailer, fifth wheel, you know, usually pulled behind a, uh, a pickup truck, uh, providing temporary living quarters, Travel use approved for the size and weight uh, for special highway movement permits uh, when drawn by a motorized vehicle. Has a living area not less than 220, to 220 square feet, uh, excluding built in equipment and bath and toilet rooms. So, state code is a little bit different. They have uh, 320 square feet um, as the, uh, the square footage of a typical travel trailer fifth wheel. And then truck camper, so this is usually on the top of a, a truck bed, um, you know, consisted of a floor size designed to be loaded on top of a bed of a pickup truck. So these are these spaces, you know, this is typical RV park uh, within the, the Lions Club park. So these have about five spaces here. Um, this is the Rambler RV park. So this is just outside of city limits in the area city impact. Um, this is Dan Max, so Carmichael Road here, you enter here, there's some overflow, uh, mainly RV storage over here, but mainly just consists of the, the single uh, access drive of the RVs. So you can see it's quite a bit different than a typical mobile home park. Um, usually there's some type of gravel aggregate uh, surface, uh, as well as a uh, pretty wide berth as far as the streets and then the spaces in order to maneuver and, and be able to back in. Um, some of the campers that you see. And then getting back to uh, Mr. Lester's mobile home park, some <coughs> shots that I think he had submitted before when this uh, was being heard by the commission. So, you know, oftentimes the parks are developed with paved surfacing, curb, um, gutters in order to, uh, 
get storm water out of the area and just you know more of a, uh, a residential street that you'd see so taking a look at uh, the proposal you know we could have a distinction between RVs and mobile home parks and just RVs and RV parks if we we chose to uh, you know like I mentioned they're a little bit different just by the way of the permanent improvements um, you know, the mobile home parks are meant to be more of a permanent situation. RV parks are, are just temporary living quarters for uh, RVs. So we've talked about this and are really just comfortable, you know, with the possibility of maybe eliminating the six-month limitation within mobile home parks, but not maybe not necessarily RV parks. Um, you know, maybe a possible maximum percentage of RV spaces which are allowed. And then we get into kind of the, the tiny home issue that most tiny homes are declared RVs if they're constructed on a chassis and wheels. And they're also required to be licensed with a state DMV for highway travel. So oftentimes people with tiny homes, um, you know, they're readily movable. And so they, uh, they're they oftentimes declared RVs. Most people have them on chassis uh, and wheels in order to be able to pull them out of there and put them somewhere else. Uh, and then you got the variants of tiny homes that are constructed on site. You know, right now it could go through a PUD. Uh, it could be in an R4 zone property or R3. You know, we allow multiple structures per lot in those zones. Uh, they are declared single family dwellings. But, um, you know, there's really no scale right now. I mean, there's a, you could build a 5,000 square foot home and it would be the same connection fees as if you, you know, pretty much uh, constructed a tiny home. Uh, with the exception of the plan review and the permitting, um, which increases depending upon the size of the, the house. So the, the permits would be different, but the, the connection fees are, are, would be similar. And then, of course, two parking spaces per dwelling unit uh, could be constructed as an ADU, uh, and we've seen some smaller ADUs uh, going in that you know, could be declared maybe a tiny home. Uh, then there's a the possibility of constructing those off-site. You know, they have to be at least a thousand square feet right now. So you can put manufactured homes on lots within the city, but they have to meet certain requirements. And so they have to be at least thousand square feet. Uh, they have to be on a permanent foundation, and they have to be certified by HUD uh, outside of a mobile home manufactured home park. So they could be declared. There's also another, you know, option. It could be declared a modular building. So Idaho Division of Building Safety, which is different from, you know, federal housing and urban development, um, has what they call a uh, modular building. Uh, they define that as any building or building component other than the manufactured or mobile home uh, that is of closed construction is either entirely or substantially prefabricated or assembled at a place other than a building site. So typically what you do is submit plans to the Division of Building Safety and uh, have the work inspected by one of their inspectors uh, prior to being delivered to the intended location. And then uh, DBS provides a modular insignia after the inspections have completed and we're able to allow these to be placed within the city with that DBS certification. So that's uh, probably a, a better option uh, for some of these tiny homes that are constructed off-site is to be able to get that certification and to be able to place it in the city. So, you know, we posed some questions last time, you know, thoughts of allowing modular buildings within mobile manufactured home parks. I think we're going through a shift here, um, you know, at, back in maybe the 60s or 70s when you had larger mobile homes. Really just not seeing mobile homes with the frequency that you were back then. And I think it's shifting to more of uh, different types of construction and living and uh, so we can maybe look at allowing some of these modular um, structures within mobile home parks as a, a you know more of affordable housing option for people that don't want a manufactured home so um, you know yeah it would allow for smaller housing options potentially tiny homes that aren't on wheels or chassis within the, the mobile manufactured home parks uh, we might need to amend the size of manufactured home lots for new parks, if that's the case. Um, and then looking at allowing RVs within manufactured mobile home parks with a six month, uh, without a six month limitation. So lifting the six month uh, requirement uh, entirely. And then maybe taking a look at the, maybe a certain percentage of RV spaces that it should be limited to if they're intermingled within a, a manufactured home park. 
And then I think last time um, everybody wanted a little bit of research as to what other jurisdictions do as far as the six month limitation. And I just kind of covered some jurisdictions locally. Uh, Lata County, they recently lifted theirs. So they used to have the six month limitation just like us. Uh, now they have no limit for RVs and RV parks or mobile home parks. And so they would allow that intermingling of, of RVs and mobile home parks. Uh, if they place an RV on a, a piece of property, then they have uh, a limitation. There's a, a time period, um, which we don't allow here. We don't allow RVs to be lived in on, on just a single, fam single family lot. So that's a little bit different. And then Lewiston, um, they really had no limit specified within their ordinance that I could find. Uh, Pullman, I think, was the only one out of the list here that had a six-month uh, limit on RV parks. But they had something uh, within their mobile home park ordinance that allowed pre-existing RVs. So there's probably an issue with RVs that you know, happened to be in mobile home parks that existed for a period of time. And uh, those were allowed to remain. Uh, but as those transition, new ones weren't allowed to be able to be placed in, in RV parks. And then Caldwell, McCall, and Ada County. I just taken a look at those, and those didn't specify a limit uh, either within uh, within their ordinances. So, a little bit of new information, but um, certainly like to invite Gary up to give a little bit of input on uh, what you know what you're thinking and and uh, how you think that that'd be a good thing. And okay, um, well, you, you can come up to the table. Oh, sorry, it's just there. Yeah. Also. Well, thank you very much for <coughs> considering the proposal. Uh, we Gary, that. for the record, would no, yep. you go ahead and yep. sit down. Just uh, state your name and, ah. and address, if you would, please. Okay, uh, Gary Lester. I'm the owner of Abiel Mobile Home Community. I reside at 1032 uh, Julianne Way. Uh, my mobile home park is 603 West Blue River Drive. Great, thanks. So thank you all for entertaining the proposal and the request. And I think what brought it up initially was I missed out on a tiny home. I'm like, oh, because uh, she had, it was a woman who uh, was moving to uh, teach at WSU and she was bringing a tiny home with her. And uh, she drove through the park, liked the park, uh, but was basically put off by the fact there was a six month stay. She goes, I don't want to keep moving it around the impetus to uh, talk to Mike and say, hey, what, is this something? I know we mentioned it at the previous time for my application, yeah. and it uh, seemed like there was some interest in discussing it. So um, I don't know that I have anything significant to add. A great job on, on all the extra research and, and all the other types of um, uh, modulars and things like that, some stuff I hadn't even thought of. But you know, my goal, obviously, is to uh, uh, ultimately just fill, fill the park get the occupancy up you know with these empty spaces i am limited by the size the park was built in the 50s uh, i can get 48 foot trailers in some of those spots which is essentially a small two bedroom one bath house uh, brand new uh 675 square feet that's the most as far as i can get from mobile homes i can't get used ones uh that meet head code of that size so i gotta get them get them new so that that's an expensive proposition for me um uh, cost me probably well the new ones for sell for forty three thousand five hundred. That's all set up and that's like zero markup on my retailer's license. That's just straight up add the cost of the set the setup to it and sell it and um, and so that's uh, those are the nicest homes in the worst neighborhood, right? <laughs> okay, real realistically. So there's a challenge in selling those. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what I'd like to do is to get the cash flow of the park up is you know, use RVs to essentially get the cash flow going and then I can buy these homes out of pocket, rent them out for a while until they get to a certain price point where I've got a recoup and then I can get them off my inventory. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Um, I thought the tiny home thing, Moscow kind of being kind of the, the eclectic community that we've got would love the tiny home thing. Uh, I think we've got some opportunity there to, if we could get a few. Uh, I, when I first bought the park, I advertised uh, tiny, tiny home spaces, not knowing that they weren't allowed in the park. I did get some interest on Craigslist on, in that. Um, and then when I c contacted Mike, they said, no, it's not gonna fly. So I think, there's a, I think we could get some in there. And if we could get three or four side by side in there, I think it'd be a nice little show showcase for the community and that kind of stuff uh, as far as that that demographic and 
part. But ultimately, it's all about um, you know the mobile homes uh, RV uh, slash RV park is probably the most affordable way of living out there. You know, if you own your mobile home or if you own your RV, 350 bucks a month plus your power. I don't know if you can live any cheaper than that. Not, not subsidized. Too. So, so I think that's a good thing. Um, so I don't know, I'm happy to take any questions from anybody. Great. Thanks, yeah. Gary. Uh, any questions for Gary? Yeah. The first thing that comes out to my mind is uh, let's talk about uh, toilets and units. In other words, can there be an RV unit that does not have an interior uh, toilet? No, not no. I've turned a couple of those away because like truck campers and stuff like that. I don't have public facilities. Right, right. Yeah, so right. if it was like a campground and I had, had well, a it seems to me that that's a, 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 an important a little a note to put with mm -hmm. if we say RV, but we presume that they have a toilet. I have turned, turned, I've turned a couple away since we got permitted. Uh, uh, somebody said I got a truck camper. I'm like, well, does it have does it have a facility toilet in there? And they said no. I'm like, sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> I'm not gonna let you, you know, hold it until you gotta go right, there. Somebody right, go right. to A&W to use their facilities. Or and something. Yeah, and even in RV parks, they require <coughs> if there's gonna be, you know, unless it's totally self-contained, <coughs> um, they require you to have some type of facility to bathe and shower. And things like that and get, get clean water out if, if it's declared a campground a campground yep. 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 yep I think that's a, a good point though and it's something that probably needs to be acknowledged and as we're constructing what we're going to well, do well one assumes when one sees one of those big beautiful RVs <laughs> you then you don't think about uh, obviously it's going to have something in it on the other hand if there's an older unit I don't know at what point <laughs> those <coughs> the, uh, you know, I, 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 I take it back in my own uh, little life. I lived for the first six years of my life in a trailer. I was a, my, my father was an evangelist. We were roadies and uh, we didn't have, we had a, a little honey pot, mm. but that's all we had. Mm -hmm. So hello. And <laughs> that, that was uh, in the 1930s. Uh, you know, but then you just wonder how, uh, as things change, you want to be clear yeah. about what you shouldn't have to uh, give a arbitrary judgment on somebody. It should be clear. Right. Yeah, I agree. Right. <coughs> Victoria, do you have something? Oh, uh, do we know why Poland also had a six-month uh, condition? I don't know that. No, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't talk to him about that. Well, considering we're both college towns, I wonder there's something there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because help. I seem to have a vague memory that I was on the commission when we did this, the six month limit. Is that fairly recent? Mm -hmm. Like last few years? No. I no. Don't, for far RV parts, it's, it's, yeah, it's time. been there for, for the uh, yeah. Okay. Well, it, we did something though, though. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was. And this just this was brought up. Yeah, that might be all what I'm thinking. Yeah. Back in well, August when I did mine. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we talked about this back then. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how we, we just talked. Yeah, yeah, we just talked about the issue at the time. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's so been it's, there for quite a while. So it's probably, probably old enough. Nobody, nobody knows what, <laughs> what the theoretical problem. I think we changed it. I think we changed it from like, we did something, because uh, we brought up and we changed something in six months, and now we're saying yeah. that, just get rid of that. Is making sense now, huh? Yeah. It's kind well, of it's right. just yeah, talking about it. I mean, I think the the reason it was originally there was just because these are supposed to be temporary, you know, for recreation, and they've kind of, I mean, hybridized a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. you start to get like the park yeah. model, you know, they're starting to become, you know, larger and nicer, and you get the park well, models that are more of a hybrid between. The thing them is, it, I, if I get it right, when for several years, you know, we were a headquarters for a summer. RV event. Oh, they used to come to do. campus. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are people out there who are living in these RVs that have retired and they're living in You're it, right. period. Yeah. And they may move every six months or not. I don't know whether they do or not, but they don't have a home anymore. They're just, uh, they're it's absolutely. So yeah. the world has changed uh, right before yeah. our eyes. But, yeah. well, a question comes up. <coughs> you know, we've, we've talked about this and discussed lots of things. Is there truly a downside something I'm not seeing 
to extending this to 24 months or waiving the whole thing. Um, I know for a fact that I had an opportunity to hire a young man that was not prepared to buy a home, but he wanted to put his RV down and live in it, and it was a pull-type trailer. I had all the amenities of my home, and he figured it taking two years to get in a position to either build or buy a home. Mm -hmm. Well, he was kind of at odds with what the rules were. Another question that came to mind was, I know a lot of construction guys, yeah. they come on big jobs, they're here for 24 months. Yeah. And I suppose technically by the law, you could pull out of one spot and move over to the next spot and back in. Currently yeah. not in not, 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 not <laughs> now, you gotta leave the park. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But it- That, uh, is, that is another it, demographic though. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the campgrounds most of them have seven or ten day limits on them, and so those aren't an option to go there. And so I just wondered if there was a downside, something that I wasn't seeing that said this is a bad idea because. Yeah, I uh, I like the idea of doing something here. But one of the thoughts that occurred to me is, um, could we construct something um, ordinance wise that would be in effect, let's say, a two year test period? where we'd say, okay, we're going to eliminate, we're gonna put the provisions in that Nell's talking about, we're gonna make sure that it's got the appropriate limitations, but then have a way to come back and revisit this in two years to say, okay, yeah, this worked. Uh, we got some <coughs> tiny homes in. Uh, we're, we're seeing that this is actually a positive thing. And then I, I don't know if there's a provision <coughs> that we can do something like that. I suppose we could say, all right, we're just gonna Construct this uh, using the the ideas that you've you've put forth here, and then we could always revisit it. But it would be kind of nice to to try this out. Um, I like the idea. I think we need to do something. Um, I just not quite sure. Do we need to? Does it need to be an ordinance? Um, yeah, that to be an ordinance because we'd be amending certain portions of the manufactured home and RV park codes. So yeah, we'd have to have an ordinance. Um, you know, I'm not as familiar with, with expirations or I guess setting a, a sunset date on these. Um, you know, we have effective dates that could be pushed out and I would imagine that just because you can have an effective date that's, you know, not the date that it actually gets signed but a, a, a period in the future uh, that we'd maybe be able to do that. But I'd probably suggest that we just, you know, if commission chooses to, uh, amend it and then just revisit it after two years and take a look at it and, and it see yeah. you know that way we don't have to go through the whole process again and you know have draft another ordinance to be approved yeah. and go through you know that whole thing again um, we can just look at it and if you know it's working then we don't have to do anything yeah. we can, well, you know, given the fact that at least three of the cities that we looked at don't have don't any, have anything any, yeah it doesn't seem very uh, dangerous and we're we're not you know it, when a city even even Coeur d'Alene would be a different place if you're growing by two or three percent a year it, you might want to be pay a little closer attention we're clearly not doing that we're having a hard time <coughs> of, of saying that we grow at one percent so uh, it just doesn't seem like there's much <coughs> reason to be over concerned. I, yeah. I think we could probably yeah. just. Uh, I think what they were scared of originally was just some, like Beverly Hillbillies coming in there and just packing up there for a couple of years. But I think we thought Gary wouldn't let that type of in there. But I don't want that. You know, <laughs> if, if cash flow gets tight, Gary sells out and someone else lets, yeah. Yeah, starts that's, letting that's people like that in there and just letting them. Yeah, yeah. But that's not much different than I, I live next door to the Elysian Apartments and on any given year in the last 40 years, sometimes there's a ruckus going on in the alley and you wonder what happened? And then you go for five years and there, uh, it, everything's quiet. So who rented the apartment? Some guys who are, or girls or whatever. So I, I don't think it. I, well, just I devil's advocate. There's yeah. people there with trailers now that moved in there, in a in a mobile home park, not a not an RV park. 
And so now they're having to adjust, which, you know, they might be fine with. I don't know, but now they're having to adjust for someone to come in there with well, God knows what. Well, he'd be the first one to be worried about if people decide to start leaving. Yeah, uh, and that's what we've come to. The market, to. The market, the market would yeah. certainly yeah. Uh, play that and one That's out. kind of what we've come to. The, the owner of the place would, would probably monitor yeah. that and not, you know, so hopefully. That's one of the things that I would consider a downside to be aware of. Yeah, we yeah. may have a very good owner here that's going to take care of things, but we don't know that that's going to be the case in all cases, and we could wind up with a problem. So I, so yeah, I addressed uh, that. I anticipated that question. I, I talked to my mentor who owns. He's the he got me into this, uh, and he owns like 200 mobile home parks around the country, and he's the fifth largest. And he said they got a lot of RVs, and I asked him about before I came here about this and he said, what, I said what would be the issue for the downside right and he said well a lot of those were put in originally to avoid the quote-unquote dregs of society coming in and squatting and he said I presume that you if you're gonna good park owner are gonna be screening your tenants and people that are gonna be not getting involved with the cops all the time <coughs> are gonna be having you know at least a financial wherewithal to cover the $350 a month lot rent and um, so that really is an ownership management issue. Um, I tried to get mm -hmm. my property manager here tonight, but he couldn't make it. But uh, mm -hmm. we, do, we do screen um, back criminal background, credit checks, and employment verification and all that stuff. Because we do want to, I personally, mm -hmm. do want to create a nice environment. And you're right, the next guy down the street may not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You know, we can't so. release this, these kinds of things. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's another thing. <laughs> So does this does this apply just to RV parks or does it is it now legal to to have a certain number of spaces in a mobile home park or are they kind of the same? Well, no, we've always yeah them. we've always had two separate things so RV parks and mobile home parks. Um, Gary's kind of the first one that did the kind of yeah. a hybrid. You know, I mean, I think that other parks. Um, I think the Empire Lane one had was set up for some. Uh, RV spaces right along yeah. Hulk there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they ever moved forward with that, but they had it set up there for a while. And so, I think it's kind of a natural, you know, a natural thing that you have happen where there's a, you know, maybe a few RV spaces within mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. But Gary's really the first one that's actually yeah. gone through the process with us and and you know had those intermingled within a mobile home park. So, yeah. so, so you get like you get the same lot rent. Whether or not it's I, a I charge a little bit more because of for the, uh, RV? for, for the RVs. Yeah. It's uh, right, it's like three twenty five for the trailers and then three fifty for the RVs, yeah. and that's because uh, I'm trying to get a little bit more on those because of the in and out trip more transient. When I do a refi on the park, the bank will you know look at they they value the 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 RV spaces lower because of that. So I I trying to offset that a little bit, and it's still a lot cheaper than the. Um, uh, Dan Mack, uh, I think he's like four ninety five a month or something yeah. out there. So yeah. um, he might include internet or phone or something, but I, which I don't. But um, so uh, so that's the only difference that I have, and that's more for just thinking down the road for a potential refi on the park, um, yeah. which would allow me to do some other things there too. So so I guess kind of where <coughs> I'm where I'm going on that is that so there's there's a number of other parks that are in rougher to rougher shape and so would it then make economic sense for somebody in one of those parks to to basically throw away the ancient uh, mm -hmm. mobile homes mm -hmm. and pretty much convert to an RV park mm -hmm. and is there you know if if they can still call it a mobile home park I don't know if that makes any difference but and is is that a bad thing is there a downside to that like if somebody Oh, yeah, I guess I don't want to name names. I guess there's a, like a couple of parks that have maybe a dozen, 15 spots. But I mean, is there a downside to clearing out the older trailers and, and switching over to almost a, a total RV place? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> driving through some of the bad mobile home parks, probably not. You know, I mean, yeah. might bring it up, bring quality there, up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but they'd have to still go. I mean, it's a different thing. Mobile home park and RV <coughs> park are two separate things. Um, so they'd have to go back, you know, go through kind of the same process that Gary did and, uh, you know, bring it up to kind of current standards. I think a lot of the, the real uh, 
run down ones probably wouldn't meet current RV park standards even. So mm -hmm. um, they would have to do that. They have to go through the commission to get approval on it. Yeah. I, I think I'd like to just <coughs> move forward on this yeah. and go ahead and get an ordinance, get it into the public process. Uh, we'd have to have a public hearing and we'd get some additional input. But I, I, I like the idea of trying uh, the tiny home piece of it makes yeah. sense. Uh, and I, the idea just seems right to me. And yeah, could there be some downside? I, I, I don't suppose there's anything that doesn't have some downside <laughs> to it. But I, I think it's worth pushing forward with. I, I'd like mm -hmm. to see us move forward. I, and I don't know, do you need uh, other than just general direction from us on going ahead and getting started rewriting the ordinance and then setting up a no no I, yeah we can but let's let's make sure that I'm not speaking well, out of turn here clarify exactly what you're saying well because what you I'm talked saying about a pilot program and now you're saying well I, I think that we've decided that maybe trying to put a sunset provision on it is not a real workable kind of a thing so this would be uh, revising the ordinance uh, bringing it to the public and then ultimately the city council and moving forward with it. So when we look at kind of those questions about should we draw a distinction between RV parks and mobile home parks or just not worry about it at all? Well, I think the idea of a hybrid is what maybe is hybrid? kind of, uh, and maybe you even write it in, in that sense. I, I So I think that maybe let's we're, we're trying to make sure that we're relevant to what's happening around and so well, let me ha just ask you another a question what if somebody with an RV comes in and you find out they're they want to d be there for f three or four months is there a different price that comes uh, with that? No, I, bas I basically will only do a one month minimum, I'm not doing the weekend thing, kind of people coming and going on game weekends because I can't manage that at that level. I'm just doing month, month to month up to six months currently. Um, but there's no there's no price difference. Yeah, so I, I originally thought about maybe, hey, if you do a, you know, it'd be like more for one, one month, but if you do like two or more months, reduce it. But I, I, it's not, it's not, not, not worth it yet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, I think we, let's make this. Um, we've talked about the tiny homes piece of it. Uh, I think that Nell's point about making sure that it's a self-contained unit uh, is is an important part of. You know, we'll, we'll put some structure around it, but I, if everybody else is game, I'd like to see us mm -hmm. move forward with it. I like the hybrid ideal, but it, I don't like a camper on the back of a truck being included. Yeah, but no. they're not going to have a toilet. Right. I don't think there's any I've question about I've, that. I've said no, oh, yeah, no to that one already. Yeah, that's why having that <laughs> issue yeah. in yeah. there delineated yeah. in there. It exactly. seems to me that from a uh, in a state like ours that's frightfully underfunded, uh, you know, anything we can do to make it possible for people to live in a, a in a less expensive way is really uh, I don't. I, I don't. Uh, I don't know what the word is, but um, trying to get uh, housing that you can afford is really uh, a help yeah. to folks that are <coughs> making uh, twelve dollars an hour. We've been talking about the affordable housing issues since I've been on the commission, and maybe this will be a step forward yeah. with the tiny home the RV, who's to say somebody put an RV in there and live in it for a couple of years and then mm -hmm. mature to a tiny home or I, I just think this is something that we can do to help people live and work in Moscow. And, and given that affordable, what you said about the affordable housing, it might not, might not make sense to distinguish between RV park, the stay limit within an RV park and a hybrid or a mobile home park. Because it allowed, well, I don't know, do we have any RV parks in the city? Well, we got the, the Lions one. We just have the Lions too. one. I mean, <laughs> like we've always talked about, like we brought this up before, that, I mean, really the six month limitation is something that is unenforceable by us because we have no idea of when they come in and when they leave. You know, mobile homes are required to get a set permit. We've got to make sure they've got all the so strapping it seems like and everything. It's just paperwork on the wall. I think <laughs> we can get rid of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I mean, when it comes in handy is, you know, maybe somebody like, uh, you know, has a junk RV and they've been there for this time, we have a tool to be able to get them out of there, you know, would kind of be the only thing. Um, that I would see is you know maybe yep. an advantage, but I mean if you're in an RV park, <coughs> you're probably not going to have some long-term tenant anyway. I mean the Lions one, they do a good job of enforcing that. I, I yeah, think you can only yeah. stay there. I think maybe yeah. ten to you know maybe two it, weeks maximum. So I mean that might be the automatic <laughs> sort of owner driven thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you are set up and willing to mess with uh, renting to somebody for a weekend or a week, I mean, I think there's probably a decent chance if you could make more money doing that if you have a half a dozen or a dozen spots. Yeah, this guy, my property manager, take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Game weekends, that kind of stuff, you know, I mean, yeah. there's there's all sorts of draws there. And I, I, I bet I can firmly state that there are many RVs that are nicer than the first place I ran. Oh, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, here, here. Yeah. Well, let, let's go ahead and okay. move this forward right. then, and okay. we'll we'll do the normal process of okay. reviewing the the draft and then getting public hearings. Uh, then one uh, last thing that to uh, be uh, said is that in our neighborhoods, typical neighborhoods, some people move in to a house, rent a house that aren't willing to uh, kind of live up to the uh, neighborhood standard, you don't have any place to go. There's no, but the difference here is that there's a m property management, yeah. so you've got uh, 60 units or 70 units, and you know exactly if something goes wrong, you immediately call the manager, mm -hmm. and so th that you have a, a self-guiding thing if you in, in my own case, somebody moves in across the street and they're just a junk. Yeah. Bud, what are you going to do? Call the mayor? you got to be kidding. <laughs> you know, you can't get any action out of that. And so, uh, you mayor. can. And so, I do think that uh, there's, a, there's a protection built into. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not making yeah, fun no, of the mayor. No, I'm just <laughs> saying that no, just you can't be telling people how to live in their house that right. if whether they rent it or buy it. But if you're in um, one of these uh, units uh, where you have a manager, yeah. you're more likely to uh, say, "Gee, that is a, we don't do that here." Yep, exactly. You know. Okay. Well, I guess we'll move this forward. Gary, thank you very much for You're joining welcome. us and, and thank bringing you. the issue to thank us. Thank you all very much for appreciate considering. It. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, Thanks. Yes, ma'am. I just have two quick questions. The, so would this, the way the tiny homes, you had them divided by if they're on wheels or not wheels. So if the limitation is lifted, it, it wouldn't matter which type because on wheels is considered an RV. Is that correct? A tiny home on our on wheels is considered an RV in the... It is, yeah. So tiny home on, an RV, it, on wheels is considered an RV. Um, yeah, we would have to take a look at um, probably reducing, you know, in order to allow the more modular state approved um, tiny homes that come in, um, we would probably have to look at amending our manufactured home code because it ties back to a manufactured home, which is the state definition. Mm -hmm. And it's always HUD HUD approved. So, so um, this particular issue here would would just apply to the tiny homes that are on wheels that are characterized as RVs. Well, I think we were going to open it up to both. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's what you know what we wanted to do. So, I think we have one inquiry about somebody wanted to bring one in not on wheels. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Was that? I, I didn't know what. It so, was. I mean, I, you know, if if we're allowing them on wheels, um, you know, which are more transient, and you have mobile homes, which are which are more permanent these days. Um, you know, I really don't see any reason why we would draw a distinction between the ones on wheels and the ones mm -hmm. that are just constructed. Mm -hmm. be, uh, so this yeah, ordinance no. would cover both? Yeah, if, uh, I think that's our yeah. intention. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Thank you. And then the one last question, when you said in to the history with 2018, approving the RVs in your park, does that mean it's only your park? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this is only going to apply to this particular park. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's not to say that other park owners could come in and request a, a certain mm -hmm. number of spaces to be designated. Um, yeah, Gary's just the first one that's, just that's they followed, the same followed, process. Followed through the process. But if we yeah, make okay. an ordinance that says it takes a, a, a twelve month or six month thing off, it'll be uh, for anybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's mm -hmm. yeah. yeah.
Okay. Thank you good. for the yeah. clarification. Sure, yeah. Just want to make sure when I'm reporting things, I have everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's not just that. for him, right? It's, it'll be for. Yeah, they would still have to get approved for RV spaces in the park. But yeah, the six month limitation would be gone for him and mm -hmm. everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, before we move on to the next item, uh, I have a special uh, thank you for uh, Kurt Obermeier, uh, who is Thanks. going to be mm -hmm. departing. Kurt, thank you so much mm -hmm. for all your years of service, your thoughtful ideas and counsel, and we're going to miss you, but we wish you the very best. I don't know if you want to say anything to the the group or to... Uh, <laughs> the TV land? Yes. <laughs> well, it's it's been a privilege I love doing it uh, very interesting very educational uh, yep been a pleasure working with you all and for us as well we have a uh, going away card here for you so right. if we get tired of the snow we'll all just come and visit you yeah <laughs> I'm gonna be here long enough tomorrow morning to burn my snow boots <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So thank you yep. so much. Yeah, it's been thank you. a pleasure working with you. We we will miss you for sure. But yep. yeah, going south sounds like a uh, wonderful thing right now. Except for you're going to be kind of at high altitude area, aren't you? It's yeah, you, you still get 60 degrees and sunshine days even in January. Oh. Yeah, so. <laughs> yes, Ar what? Arizona has made me weak. <laughs> <laughs> What's the town? Winslow. Winslow. Oh. Oh. Yep. They have two statues on the corner. Uh, as in standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Oh. There have been Japanese tourists in tears because they are actually standing on the corner. <laughs> in Winslow, Arizona. <laughs> yep. yep. Awesome. Good well, stuff. send us a picture, will you? <laughs> I shall. So, thanks so much, Kurt. Yep, thank you. All right, uh, next item, updates to the floodplain ordinance. Mike, I guess you're on again. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I think we talked about this uh, again the first meeting in January. Um, we were contacted by the state floodplain coordinator and had been working with FEMA. We had some, um, every so often they changed the requirements to the National Flood Insurance Program, which we're a member of. Um, we get a 10% uh, discount for everybody that has to carry flood insurance for numerous things that we do as far as floodplain management within the city. And so in order to be, you know, have people utilize that 10% per percent reduction, we have to be in compliance with NFIP requirements. And uh, so there's just a few things in the ordinance, and I think it's attached to your packet. Um, really just updating some definitions and some minor changes yeah. to most of the sections. Um, I think the majority of the changes show up in the uh, definitions sections. So really not changing anything that we currently do. Uh, it's just updating the verbiage to what they want uh, within the, our, our ordinance per the NFIP. And so um, it's, it's you know, fairly simple, but if anybody sees anything they want to talk about, we can certainly take a look at it. Um, but it's just one of those things that every so often um, you get you get your ordinance reviewed and, and there's a number of things that we just need to update in order to bring into compliance. But uh, the last big update was 2015, if you recall that. Um, we went through and kind of thoroughly rewrote the majority of the floodplain ordinance and we thought we had it uh, pretty much dialed in. And then, um, yeah, we have a new floodplain coordinator with the state. And uh, there's some, been some changes since then. And we just needed to come back and, and update those. So that's really what you're looking at. But um, did anybody have any issues, concerns, questions? I just saw two typos, which I thought, were, I thought this was the one where the you went back to wherever you go back to and the hyphens were not in the middle of the words because there are still two places here where the hyphens oh, are. Oh, are they still there? Still there. So page two under definitions, five two, five two. Interpretation. Yeah, interpretation. I'm gonna and have to give you an English uh, uh, honorary degree. <laughs> I have an English degree. <laughs> Page ten, uh, foundation types. It's in the middle of foundation. Get a hyphen again. 
So that's uh, hmm, FEMA TB 11 01. Actually, right above that. Two thirds of the way down. Oh, okay. Yeah. I take it that we don't have, since our flood in 97, we really haven't had a serious test. That, that would be the day after tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah, yeah. It uh, keeps raining. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, just my general question, I, I, I know it's redundant, but if you, uh, or maybe just rhetorical, but if you, you haven't seen anything that would cause you to be worried about the changes that we've made to the floodplain, there, uh, no red flags have come up, uh, I, or you would have mentioned them, I'm sure. In other words, we sort of changed the size of those yeah. floodplains, and we've done all that uh, remediation yeah. over yeah. by the university yeah. that kind of opened it up. But, yeah. but in my mind, we would probably get a chance to test it one day. I don't know when that yeah. day will come. But, you know, in, in the last 30 or 40 years, that I've been here, we only had that one time yeah. when I couldn't make it to Safeway <laughs> <laughs> because of uh, the uh, the flood. So you just I, I presume that you, you don't you think everything is copacetic. Yeah, that area has been working fine. Yeah, it's been really good over there. Uh, we still have all the upstream issues. So like Bridge Street is our biggest impediment because it's a honeycomb culvert right, right. there. And everything. That's why they stationed a big backhoe to, Seems to, to clear like the, the debris. Seems to me like the folks who are living close to that bridge should take a deep breath when uh, it starts to uh, rain. That yeah. bridge being, is being replaced, however, isn't it? Yeah, yeah we're trying to work on a, uh, I think, FEMA-funded project in order to bring that, uh, you know, get a better deal <coughs> there in order to alleviate that issue. But that's the main issue there. You know, we did the daylighting work. Uh, and the diversion work on uh, Joseph Street playfields, and so you know that should be fine. It's just up there in Bridge Street is really our biggest mm -hmm. uh, impediment. But I take it when there's ice, that's the first place the city, uh, our, our city street guys are going to go look. Is it Bridge Street? Yeah, they station the back over there. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ice is uh, jamming up. Mm -hmm. Well, are we ready to take this to? Public hearing, I guess we we need, yeah. need so, I think so. Any any other issues that we ought to? You think? Okay, I guess okay. go ahead and move it forward. Super. Okay. Uh, next item: subdivision code review. Okay. Well, uh, at the first meeting in January, we kind of briefly talked about um, the three different types of subdivisions that we we're trying to incorporate in the subdivision ordinance, and I had a little bit of time. We I think we went over Bellingham at that meeting, but I've had uh, a little bit more time, our departments, to do some research on uh, other jurisdictions that have cluster subdivision ordinances. So this was our example that we had given before, just to remind you of what uh, what we're talking about. You know, this is typically what conventionally we see uh, as far as development. Um, if you're not going through a planning and development, um, this is you know typical subdivision development where you have a minimum lot size and you just lay out the streets accordingly uh, and get a certain yield out of the area with the you know minus the parkland dedication. So this is really for those areas that have you know, significant kind of natural features that transect the property. You know, in this case, this is the extension of F Street by Good Sam, and uh, the 100-year floodplain goes through this property with Paradise Creek uh, on the western end. So the idea is to allow an incentive in order to reduce the lot sizes in order to preserve more open space than what would normally be required as part of the subdivision process. And so, um, you know, we get more open space, and that's more space to be preserved within the riparian area in the floodplain. Uh, the developer has a little bit less infrastructure as far as roadways, 
uh, and they have more ye lot yield as far as uh, the number of lots just because we allow an incentive to go uh, reduce size of the lots in order to achieve more lots to be able to sell and develop. And so that's kind of the idea. Um, gone through these examples of other uh, subdivision codes with cluster subdivisions and we'll just kind of go through, you know, there's synonymous things within each uh, ordinance and, and we'll kind of go through each of those. Um, they go through a definition and intent section. Uh, they're all pretty similar but just a little bit different. Uh, Rainier, Washington, which is southwest of Tacoma, um, small little city there. They have a, a cluster subdivision ordinance um, but their definition and intent section is really to uh, provide a mechanism to cluster housings within a residential development and so they're usually single family or attached housing and so that maybe that's twin home townhouse style and so that'll be a question later on is you know as we do this um, look at incorporating this in the code is it something that we want to open up to you know maybe duplexes two family housing you know townhouses things like that if it's the, the appropriate zone uh, or is it just single family because uh, there's really a mixture. You see quite a few that just allow this for single family development, uh, but then there are some others like Rainier that uh, would allow for single family and two family options within uh, cluster subdivision. So just something to think about. Um, on smaller lots and what would normally be allowed in existing zoning with a provision that saved land is permanently set aside as open space uh, or other recreational opportunities allows more environmentally sensitive site planning by concentrating development on the buildable portion of the site while preserving natural drainage, vegetation, uh, natural features promoting <coughs> public health, safety, welfare. Uh, take a look at uh, Whitefish, Montana, which is on the edge of Glacier. Uh, City Whitefish, they ended up adopting this uh, to meet the requirements of Montana uh, growth policy, so their Montana code. Uh, so part of the goals and policies of the city county growth policy is to provide incentives and mechanisms and new subdivisions and developments to establish and preserve open space uh, within the community in both urban and rural areas and then they've identified this as one mechanism uh, for the preservation of open space as the use of the cluster subdivisions and developments. Uh, I looked at Driggs, Idaho, uh, which is just to the west of the Tetons in southeastern Idaho. Uh, more of a rural setting you know they have a lot of uh, larger you know money you know moving in with larger homes that surround this area and so they have a little bit different growth challenges usually it's more rural they have larger lots and uh, we had taken a look at, at this section and there are some examples um, they allow cluster subdivisions and they allow varying densities this is one of the uh, more denser uh, portions of their code but um, they accommodate single two-family uses at a gross density not to exceed two new units per acre, uh, which is not very dense at all. You know, it should be applied in areas transition to lower density where the existing land use pattern is predominantly single and two-family uh, serviced by city utilities where such land use pattern is desired in the future. Uh, uses would substantially interfere with the residential nature of the district are not allowed and allows residential cluster development in exchange for preserving common open space. Uh, Bellingham, Washington, uh, allowing a variation of minimum lot size, providing the same overall density as maintained so as to preserve open space, uh, tree cover, recreation areas, scenic vistas, uh, or to reduce the amount of stormwater runoff streets and utilities where appropriate. And so I guess that's a, you know another question, um, you know, I guess looking at uh, some take, take the approach as to maintain the same overall density. So, you know, we're dedicating maybe 10% of open space in a traditional subdivision. We bring it up to 20% open space, and you're allowed to reduce the lot sizes, but you're still getting, you know, kind of the same net density over the area that you would with a traditional subdivision. And so that's kind of the, you know, do we want to go, you know, allow higher density, you know, maybe more incentive to allow, um, you know, a, a more of an incentive to, to preserve open space, you know, that's that's something to think about as well. Um, we looked at Seattle. You probably don't think as cluster development in Seattle very often, but they do have a, a code that addresses it. Uh, they intending to enhance and preserve natural features, encourage the construction of affordable housing. 
uh, allow for development and design flexibility, protect and prevent harm in environmentally critical areas. Uh, and then Leavenworth, we had taken a look at their, their code. Uh, promoting innovative development allows development to occupy that portion of the project sites that most conducive uh, development while protecting sensitive areas and to give examples steep slopes wetlands riparian areas high value habitat areas or lands with development limitations on them and Longmont Colorado this is on the front range just northeast of Boulder I think it's about a town of about 80,000 so a little bit larger um, Residential development in which lots are allowed to be smaller or narrower than otherwise required in the zoning district uh, referred to as cluster lots, but in which the overall number of lots does not exceed the maximum number of lots allowed in the subdivision by the zoning district. So they they take the other approach of you know really no net density increase, um, it's just more open space and smaller lot sizes, but you're still netting the same number of uh, you know same density, I guess. Um, cluster subdivisions are intended to create a more compact residential development to preserve and maintain open areas, uh, natural lands in excess of what would be otherwise be required by the development code. And then some municipalities have uh, minimum sizes that they of the entire subdivision that they uh, or entire piece of land uh, that they dictate, and and it's um, you know I don't know it, it seems a little arbitrary to me that you would limited in some fashion that you'd set a maximum or a minimum but uh, Longmont is uh, 10 acres in size, Leavenworth doesn't specify, Seattle is two acres, uh, Whitefish none, Driggs none, Bellingham none, Rainier is two as well. So just you know I don't know what number we would cut you know I think it just seems that every number that you come up with would kind of be arbitrary in this in this circumstance. So I don't, you know, thinking about that, I don't know that it would be worthwhile to uh, restrict, you know, projects of a, a certain size, either. Yeah, because they still have all the limitations of utilities and yeah and, and street and yeah. and I think that might be a, as much of a limiting factor as an actual physical size yeah and I mean it you know it, we've never wanted to limit the size <coughs> of PUDs either just because the fact that um, you know there's creativity out there and and uh, you never know what you're gonna you know end up with and what somebody thinks of that may be a good idea so uh, we don't want to limit it in that fashion uh, permitted uses so Longmont draws a distinction. So lots 5,000 square feet or more, you allowed one or two family dwellings. Uh, it's allowed by the, the applicable zone. And then if they're less than 5,000 square feet in size, then uh, they're just limited to single family dwellings in that case. Uh, Leavenworth doesn't specify. Seattle is just single family dwellings. Uh, Whitefish doesn't specify. Driggs, they allow both single family and two family. Uh, Bellingham doesn't specify, and uh, Rainier is just single-family dwellings for their ordinance. And then we'd also taken a look at Chelan County, Washington, and uh, they didn't have any specificity either. Uh, another common uh, item within the ordinance is minimum lot size requirements. So looking at Longmont, 3,000 square feet in size for the minimum. Um, you know, usually you're taking whatever the zoning district is, maybe it's 5,000, 6,000, and you're allowing that incentive to be able to reduce it. And so this is just looking at uh, putting a cap or I guess a limit on how low you can go as far as the, the size of the lot. So 3,000, 40 feet in width, you know, I guess to compare it with our ordinance, you know, if you're in a, uh, a this is aside from twin homes and townhouses, for, so just for single family, uh, detached structures if you're in uh, multifamily zone our minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet with 50 feet in width so um, you know it's something that uh, you would allow an incentive to go you know deviate from that and go less than, than 5,000. Uh, Leavenworth was 6,000 but then they allow it a reduction up to 50 percent uh, down to 3,000 as well um, and then it's a little confusing how they end up, you know, arriving at that. But I guess the remainder of the project site maintained its area. So essentially, you know, factoring in the streets, public services, utilities, undeveloped land, open space that's dedicated, um, you can achieve that 50% reduction by doing 
you know, a number of those things. Seattle didn't specify. Driggs was ninth out. You know, like I mentioned before, it's more of a, a lot more of a rural, uh, sprawling area of Driggs, and so they're 9,075 feet in width. You know, that's comparable to our one of our largest single-family zones is 9,600 square feet and 80 feet in width for the the lots. So um, that's pretty big. And then Bellingham is 4,040 feet detached width, uh, 30 foot uh, attached width, uh, 60 feet of minimum lot depth. And then Whitefish was one acre minimum, two acre max. Uh, Rainier was just dictated by the underlying zone. And then Chelan, uh, none specified. Then looking at the setbacks, so we have the typical setbacks for every zone that you're within in the, in the city. Um, it'd be looking at reducing the setbacks as well as what we commonly see. You know, if you're allowing smaller lots, then it makes sense to you know have this um, proportional setback reduction to the lot size. And so um, that's what you see here. So Longmont, Colorado uh, fronts 15. So this is you know we may look at going. We're already pretty low. I mean we've done a lot of things to reduce setbacks over the years. Um, in our R3 and R4, uh, we have a 15-foot setback right now. I think what comes into play is not necessarily the front and the rear setbacks, it's the side setbacks, you know, how close you can get. Um, it is 10 feet here. You know, our, ours is a combination of 15 with a minimum of 5. You know, maybe we look at just going 5 on both sides instead of, uh, you know, 5 and 10 or, you know, 7.5 and, and 7.5, and some type of combination like that. Uh, Driggs, as you can imagine, is still fairly large. Uh, Whitefish didn't specify. Seattle um, structure shall be set back a minimum distance 20 feet, so that's the kind of the front setback. Um, can't be any closer than five feet to a side lot line. And then uh, no dwelling in the cluster housing project can be closer than 25 feet to a rear lot line of an abutting single family zone lot. So they're doing a little bit more separation, you know, allowing higher density, but requiring more separation to adjacent subdivisions that aren't cluster housing. So you see like in some ordinances, uh, I think only a couple, they have landscaping requirements too. And so I don't know that it's necessarily that much of an intrusion that would warrant, you know, that big of a setback or a land, you know, additional landscaping between the uses, but it's, you know, something to, something to take a look at. Um, so the cluster housing project can be closer than five feet to any lot line abutting a non-single family zone lot. Has to be within a distance of 10 feet between the principal structures within 100 feet of the lot line of a cluster housing project development. So Chelan didn't specify Rainier uh, can utilize next higher intensity zone standards. So. You know, if they're in an R3 zone, they can go, uh, you know, be, be able to move up to an R4 zone and utilize those uh, standards. So that's that's kind of interesting. Bellingham's just 15 front, uh, five for the sides. Uh, now, obviously, they allow um, some twin homes in there, and so it'd be zero on the common property line, and then 15 for the rear. So, you know, a little bit different. I, I guess the common theme is that you know usually they have 15 for the front, 15 for the rear. You know, a lot of the zones that we have, I mean, if they're in single family predominantly zones, then we'd have a 20 foot setback usually in the front. And so it's, you know, reducing it by about five. And then the rear yard setbacks are almost always 20. So, you know, reducing it a little bit there. And then if we make the, the sides uh, just five on both sides instead of the combination, it'd be a, a reduction there. So, you know, it's kind of a common theme in the, in the setbacks. Uh, and then we get to the open space requirements. And so, it really varies, but usually you see a percentage, and then we want to define kind of what those open spaces that we're trying to preserve are. I mean, we have, you know, in the comp plan, we've identified kind of natural areas that present hazards to us, which are steep slopes and the floodplain. So I think that, uh, you know, just the floodplain itself and Paradise Creek and the, the South Fork of the, the Palouse River. Um, you know, as we grow to the northeast, which is going to be, you know, one of the logical locations as city services head up in that direction, 
you know, we're going to end up probably following uh, Paradise Creek to a certain extent. And so I think that, uh, you know, thinking about where this could be applied, you know, I think there's still some, some properties in town that, you know, could still utilize this. But, you know, as we expand out to the east and in the northeast, I think it's going to be, a, you know, present a good opportunity to be able to have maybe a repairing corridor where there's uh you know our park system extends out there you know something that we should, probably should have taken a look at 60 70 years ago as we were growing and and you know just for maintenance of the creek as well i mean that's a you know getting back to the floodplain and those requirements that's a big impediment for us is uh, a lot of people's backyards and property lines go to the center of the creek and so trying to get back there and maintain it and clear it and get all that debris out of there uh, is just a challenge for us, and so that's that contributes to our issues with the, the floodplain and, and Paradise Creek. So um, I think this would be a really good opportunity to utilize, you know, this in an ordinance that would allow people to, to do that as we develop to the east. So Longmont, uh, at least 30 percent, which is pretty high um, as far as the open space. Um, shown as common area, that area at least three quarters shall be designed as contiguous common open space instead of just separated into different areas. Uh, shall be organized and pedestrian connections to such open space provided. Uh, at least 35% of all lots in a cluster subdivision shall be platted adjacent to designated common open space, so open space frontage. Uh, each lot that is not an open space frontage lot, the walking distance, so they define kind of a, a separation, uh, walking distance between that lot and the portion of the common open space uh, is measured along street frontage and pedestrian walkway should not exceed 1,320 square feet, 1,300 linear feet, sorry. So it's about a quarter mile away. Uh, Leavenworth, they had uh, really I don't think a percentage defined they just said that uh, open space other public recreational areas identified as a result of the application of that section uh, shall be clearly identified in the face of the plat numbering of the track da, da, da. Um, held in reserve as permanent open space should not be used as a residential building lot or encroached upon any manner uh, not approved in the plat application approval uh, adequate provisions for the maintenance uh, need to be taken care of. And then uh, all open space common areas shall be accessible for the intended use without trespassing on private property. So making it, you know, remain open to everybody. Uh, Seattle, so, you know, once again, minimum two acres in size, uh, excluding submerged land and any land designated as environmental critical areas. Uh, our buffer due to the presence of a riparian corridor, wetland, wetland buffer, priority habitat, steep slope or steep slope buffer, uh, according to their uh, environmentally critical areas section of the code. Um, let's see, where portions of the site are designated as environmentally critical area or buffer due to the presence of a riparian corridor. So the regulations for environmentally critical areas, conditional use provisions under that section shall apply, superseding the standards. And then the director may exclude land from the, the cluster housing project uh, if it's separated from the site by topography. It has poor functional relationship to the site. So I, they just, you know, a lot of technical terms, they refer back to different sections. And uh, they have a lot of environmental regulations within that section that um, they designate these areas they want preserved. And so it correlates to that is, is what happens. Driggs. They have pretty much a ten, a twenty percent minimum, is, uh, and I think that's you know a, a number that I think that we had arrived at before, maybe a little bit less than that, um, but it seems like twenty percent is fairly common uh, in a lot of these cluster developments that you see. Um, the minimum width for any required, so they take it a step further and define uh, how you know the the narrowest portion of the open space that you can have, and they have that as a hundred feet. Uh, and then they have uh, options for exceptions if there's elements such as trail easements or parks. And then on sites less than 40 acres, uh, no more than one pot of development is allowed. The remaining open space must be contiguous. Uh, where multiple roads serve a property, additional pods of development may be approved. Uh, where they improve the protection of the key site resources by reducing the intrusion of development into the site. A required open space must adjoin any neighboring 
areas to dedicate open space or other protected natural areas. And then, uh, so they have kind of a, a tiered system where they have primary open space areas and then kind of secondary open space areas. Um, and the primary ones are ones that are within the 100 year floodplain. So land is elevated is lower than two feet above the elevation of the 100 year floodplain. Uh, those are the kind of primary areas and then land within a hundred feet of a wetland. So usually, um, you know, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had the federal uh, wetlands inventory that they go off of and, and uh, that's typically what us, you know, we as a nation go off of is the National Wetlands Inventory and so um, we'd likely tie it back to that if, if we chose to identify wetlands in this. And then slopes above 25% of at least 5,000 square feet of contiguous area. So, you know, a lot of things that we have in common here, um, you know, the floodplain, we have areas of, that have wetlands, habitat associated with them, uh, mainly just because we have, you know, water, we have Paradise Creek and, and uh, the floodplain. And so naturally we have wetlands areas. So those three things, you know, I can see that are items worth preserving uh, in this you know, type of ordinance. And then a state designated wildlife corridor and that's, you know, largely in the west of the Tetons and in a rural setting, uh, you have designated wildlife corridors, uh, migrating habitats that go through there. And so uh, they chose to have that as a priority. And then they have a number of secondary open space areas uh, that must be included as open space once the primary open space are exhausted. So they, with this tiered system, they just, you know, you're required to preserve the, the primary ones before you move on to the secondary ones. So the secondary examples are just like natural features, scenic views, ridge lines, open vistas, uh, across meadows or fields or rivers or stream views. And then wildlife habitat or habitat protection areas uh, listed in the comprehensive plan. Uh, whitefish has to be preserved uh, greater than the area to be developed. Uh, this area shall be the meet the following standards. So that's you know really large area. They're talking about 50 percent there. Um, stormwater management facilities may be acceptable provided they are incorporated as a natural feature. Uh, looking at the natural elements such as a meadow, <coughs> grove of trees, or wildlife corridor, stream, other water body, hillside, area of riparian resource, or other natural features given highest priority. And then they also have historic elements uh, when present. So they have prime farmland, archaeological or cultural features that are listed or eligible on the National Register. Could be incorporated as well. And then they get down to existing trees, you know, significant vegetation. Uh, that could be maintained as alternate landscaping. Uh, Bellingham, they go through um, kind of the following parameters that may apply that are satisfied. Uh, the proposed design addresses any special conditions, uh, prerequisite considerations or significant environmental elements, uh, compatible with the existing topography, preserves natural resources, and connecting links between existing parks, open spaces are provided along streams, ridgelines, ravines. So you, you, know, you kind of see a common theme that goes on with all of these as far as the types of things they're looking at preserving. And then 15% of the total site area shall be set aside as open space. So um, a little bit less, you know, ranges probably 15, 20%, I think is kind of the common ballpark on these. Of course, you have the more rural ones that are, are way up there, but um, you know, more city-oriented, urban-oriented, or, or more of the 15 to 20 percent, it looks like. And then I think lastly, Chelan County, um, <coughs> so looking at maximizing open space, preserving natural habitat, critical areas, and then they specifically say the checkerboard uh, situation is uh, not, is incompatible with clustering, uh, being able to do that. Um, locate buildable lots on land which will retain an optimal agricultural land for production. So this is an agri agricultural districts. Uh, optimal agricultural land shall in include topography, slope, historical productions, soil type, <coughs> and then open space of at least 70 percent shall be provided. So once again, this is you know Chelan County, and it's it's uh, really large areas, so it's a little bit of a difference between a county and a city, but. 
still trying to preserve kind of this, the similar similar items here. Uh, clustering on steep slopes or other land development limitations, multiple clusterings of groups of two or more building lots may be placed throughout <coughs> the development, provided the following can be met. Take advantage of natural selves and terraces as appropriate, and the placements a lot minimizes grading. So then there's just other you know things that kind of caught my attention looking through these. So Longmont has a, a 30 foot landscape buffer. Uh, they require along the boundary of a cluster subdivision when it abuts uh, another single family uh, subdivision as well as public rights away uh, in order to establish a visual screen between the adjacent uses. And then the perimeter buffer shall be in addition to required building setbacks. And so that's kind of unique to Longmont. And then Bellingham, I think we talked about this before. Uh, they have, I thought it was, you know, kind of neat. They have a transition of smaller lot sizes. So, you know, instead of maybe a landscape buffer or larger setback when they're adjacent to these single family neighborhoods. They have what they call the kind of a transitioning of smaller lot sizes. So um, they have larger lot sizes within the, the cluster subdivision on the edge uh, when they're adjacent. So they're more comparable with that neighborhood and then they transition to the smaller lot sizes uh, and you know as they transition out from those single family neighborhoods. So. You know that's kind of a good idea. I think it's in lieu of requiring, you know, all that landscaping or additional setback. I think it, you know, it's, it's probably nice to be efficient of, uh, you know, space and, and lots in, in that manner. So, so kind of recap, you know, these common considerations that uh, we see in the, you know, all these ordinances are kind of what zones they're permitted in. I guess that's the first question. Um, is it just single family zones or do we carry it over to, you know, more two family zones or multifamily zones? Um, what uses are permitted? So that kind of goes along with the zone discussion. Um, you know, is it just single family, two family? Uh, it seems like it's one or the other. You know, we don't see too many that have multifamily. It's usually just, you know, single family and two family structures. Um, kind of minimum, maximum size of the entire development. You know, I think, like we talked about before, I think that'd kind of be arbitrary to put us, a, you know, restrict us in some fashion to say that uh, if it's below a certain size, they can't do it. If it's above, they can't do it. So um, I don't know that that'd be a, a wise thing to do is to put a limit on that. And then individual lot size width requirements. So looking at, you know, maybe it's a percentage of what we have in each particular zone. Um, maybe we just go through and in our table uh, just go through all the different setbacks for the cluster subdivision and all the rest of the you know traditional subdivision some of the other ones uh, what the setbacks are uh, open space requirements so defining a percentage I think is probably the direction we want to go and then uh, you know defining what it is we're trying to preserve, you know, what's eligible, if there's things that aren't eligible uh, for the open space uh, allowance, and then whether or not we want to include some type of landscaping. And so this is, I, I think, that how, you know, we envision incorporating this into kind of the tables. Um, you know, this is what our table looks like, and so I think we'd have to go through and, you know, I think the most reasonable thing to do is, is just go through and add cluster um, yeah. cluster development and you know we have all the minimum lot areas you know we can have the reduction and just go through by the zone and uh, have it you know instead of a percentage off of whatever the zone is just go through and you know maybe take a percentage and round it to an even number just to make it you know nice and even to work with um, but do it that way and then uh, you know look at the open space you know, the open space for just uh, regular subdivision development, you know, it's tiered by the zone, it increases uh, by height, how, uh, how dense the zone is. Uh, but this is just our regular parkland dedication right now for the, for the open space. And so it's thinking about, you know, putting this into higher percentages for the increased lot yield as part of these developments and putting it into some type of matrix and then kind of giving you an idea of what the net density is uh, per the development, you know, to give people an idea of, of what you can yield. But, um, 
you know, like I said, this is our bulk and placement regulations table, so it'd probably be either trying to incorporate it in this or having a separate table that kind of goes through everything, but I think it makes probably the most sense just to, to add it on some of these lines for <coughs> cluster subdivision uh, and the uses as well. So I think that's, uh, you know, the direction we were, you know, just from the research and, and talking about it, I think it makes the most sense. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you can see some of those ordinances are better than others, but I think it's uh, some of them are a little convoluted. You're, it's hard to tell exactly, you know, how much open space. You, I think they leave it open-ended to a certain extent to be able to negotiate that. But I think it's better to have, uh, you know, set requirements, and so everybody knows what's expected. And, and I mean, that's the whole point of this. You know, not requiring them to go through a PUD and and having something in the code that if they meet the requirement, they can do it out, you know, do it through a subdivision plat. And so um, I think we want to, you know, codify as much as we can. Yeah. I, uh, I like the idea uh, of pushing the boundaries a little bit on the open space requirements. Um, and the other thing was that, you know, we're trying to maximize open space. We're trying to, as a community, maximize density a little bit. So I'd like to see us, um, you were talking about single family or two family, I mean, I, I would like to see it move across that. But I, sure. one of the other things that caught my attention that I really liked was that there had, it had to be continuous space. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to, to see us push for, for that. Yeah. I know that the long, was it Longmont had the 30% requirement? I mean, I know that's pretty significant. Maybe we can't get quite that far, but but uh, I'd like to see us push that okay. uh, a little bit. But okay. yeah, I mean, I, and I keep thinking as you were going <coughs> the, the briefing uh, that uh, Wendy gave us on, on the concepts of, of cluster, and I still have the pictures that were in that book in my head when we're, when we're dealing with this. So I, I, yeah, I think I'd like to get kind of progressive as a community on this. That's just my personal opinion, but uh, I, I think we've got an opportunity to really accomplish something here. Okay. So, for what it's well, I mean, I think the examples, I mean, it's what really wide ranging. I mean, that some of those rural communities are really up there and I mean, most of the communities open space anyway. So, yeah, right. um, yeah, it's just, you know, what fits for us. But um, yeah, I, you know, we could take a look at it and then, you know, trying to maybe instead of just, uh, yeah, I mean, just allowing more density, more open space. I, yeah. You know, it seems like a more of a win-win. Yeah, that, that that definitely looks to me like it's a good, uh, it's a good opportunity for the builder, the you know the people that are developing the lot, to allow them some smaller lots, more lots, and get an increase in this open space. Yeah, I mean, win-win. Yeah. yeah, perfect terminology. Yeah, there might be a lot less less uh, earth moving going on too if this. Well, well it's infrastructure too. I mean, you know, it's, it's instead of wide roads, you know, a little bit narrower. They don't have to. <coughs> the whole land's not taken up by infrastructure, and so um, I, I think it could really pencil out pretty well, and we get you know good connected open space and preserving kind of those areas that we want to preserve. So. Is it, would it be making it too complicated to think about uh, a, a density bonus for more open space left? You know, I, there were a couple communities that I, I kind of left out because it was so long, but some yeah. of them have, you know, just looking through there, um, some of them have, yeah, some bonuses that you can achieve, you know, higher density. So, yeah, I mean, maybe it's... I, it was just the kind of turned me off on the ones that were in here just because it was so long and yep. complicated yeah. and uh, but I yeah I mean it, if we could figure something out that was easy to work with and to be able to achieve it you know that they could I mean we do that for uh, PUDs you know with, with bonuses so um, yeah well, I don't see any reason why we couldn't at least to, to me do that. to add the latitude because each development and each Acreage is going to be a standalone, s separate entity with a different set of criteria and a different availability of 
open space and yeah. to put that into into a legal lease and gives you some adaptability to work with the developer I, I think it's great yeah, yeah well, I mean, maybe it's like pathways too I mean yeah. you got the open yeah. space but then maybe you get a you know incentive to increase by a certain amount if you put a pathway through the you know through that mm -hmm. common space you know it's, I guess, it's things yeah. like that I think you can see as as a bonus that would be good Yep. I think, I mean, my initial impression is not to worry about views and things like that, but, but just leave it on the, the big three that we'd have around here, which is yeah. slope, wetlands, and, and floodplain. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it there was a, uh, you know, I, I started out, I started working in uh, Park City area when I got out of college, and Summit County had a, uh, a ridgeline preservation mm -hmm. ordinance, and so that was, you know, you couldn't, pretty much build a house on top of a, a ridge line that was viewed from the highway corridor. Yeah. You had, so we go up there with a big white pole and a flag on top of it, and you had to bring <coughs> it down. You couldn't crest over that ridge line because they wanted to, you know, yeah. protect yeah. those scenic ridge lines that make that area so unique. And so, I mean, that's just you know, kind of one example. But we really don't. I mean, all of our yeah. ridge lines seems like they have homes on them, or you know, yeah. they're yeah. Like that. not really ridges, but hill hill hillsides. Yeah. So, so where do we? Uh, what kind of direction would you like from us to, to move forward? I think I, we're just going to keep working on it, and okay. uh, you know, try to draft something up, and then work on maybe what the the tables here look like. Yeah, I like your idea of incorporating with the table. Yeah. That, that and then we'll we'll get that done, and then try to uh, move forward with some of the other example, some of the other options like traditional subdivision with the alleys. You know, okay. kind of work on. Uh, we've got some examples I think Leah put together on that so take a look at what those look like and and uh, you know see what incentives we can we can give for do you want some specific direction from us with respect to the percentage of open space required uh, and or the single versus uh, multi or, or two family well uh, we can just how about we just take a shot at it and then we can just bring it and talk about it okay and then Great. look at it and Super. go from there you okay. can always change it so question uh, I, I like the cluster thing this is sort of an aside in a lot of hearings the wetland thing comes up and it always goes back to the federal uh, identification thing yeah. which I'm thinking is like really long time ago that they did that so how do you how do you get these things that are to be current? Because I know when people get up and at public hearings, they really feel this is a wetland, and then it comes back. Well, the map says it isn't, but the map is always really old. I think we require a wetlands delineation, which is not a hard thing. I mean, you, you have to hire a professional hydrologist to do it. Um, when Logos School got developed out there, that they, was one. They hired. That was one example mm -hmm. of. Um, they yeah. hired and there were numerous wetlands on the property that they ended up uh, having to mitigate in some fashion and they go through the Army Corps of Engineers and so a lot of times uh, what they allow you to do is relocate those to other areas of the property so you there's no net loss of wetlands they're just relocated or preserved in the area it just it all depends on where they lie on the property and, and how it's proposed to be well, developed but and it depends on the quality of the wetlands it depends on it and you might have to mitigate it more than one to one yeah. uh, and I don't think there's any wetland banks in the area but that's another opportunity that they have it's a it's, it's a pretty involved yeah. process so but I mean it's it's a real specific process yeah, yeah you know I we get calls every once in a while because uh, you know most subdivisions we have stormwater detention ponds. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've seen a lot of what those look like over the years, they have coattails and and uh, I mean they look like wetlands. You know they probably have the mm -hmm. same features with soil and everything, but it's a stormwater detention pond. So you know in one of those ordinances they actually you know give specifics on what is and what isn't a wetland and you know purposely goes through that you know a previously dedicated stormwater detention pond or you know swale area that was previously dedicated to stormwater you know is not classified as a wetland you know it has to be you know pretty much naturally occurring uh, in order to be declared a wetland so um, 
we mainly just have people, you know, issues with, with complaints and of new development where there's adjacent to a stormwater detention pond in certain circumstances that people think are, are wetlands when they're not. They're just, you know, stormwater detention ponds. But, I, yeah, I think, you know, we want to get a, a delineation done. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about the entire cost of a project, it's probably fairly small compared to all the architect, you know, engineering and, and architectural design that goes into them. So. The, the mitigation can get really pricey. That's that's where you're at. Getting somebody to come in and do a delineation is not so much of an issue, but the mitigation piece of it can run into some pretty yeah. significant. But in this circumstance, if we're preserving those areas and, you know, I mean, right. it's mainly just identifying yep. where they are on the property exactly. and then being right. able to develop around them. And yep. You, you know, don't have to go really through that the, process. really the whole goal yep. to, to keep, keep them in place yeah. and preserve them. Exactly. So. I have a question, Rob. Yes. Like, so would the open space uh, requirement meet the uh, conventional park <coughs> requirement in a development? Would that take the place? Yeah, that'd of be that? the yeah. It'd take okay. the place of that only. In, you know, instead of being the six seven percent that we mm -hmm. typically have, it'd be you know what we're talking okay. about maybe Sorry. twenty percent. Yeah. So okay. yeah, it would it would take the place of of that. Mm -hmm. So the, that park and the current is just considered. You could also just call that open space, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the, this this way, we're incentivizing uh, both the uh, open space and the the density is what we're kind of trying to achieve here, and well, some design issues. Uh, yeah, it doesn't do much for density overall, you know. No. But uh, it might have a good effect in just simply getting people used to the idea that maybe maybe you don't really need a five thousand square foot lot to be right. happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, that and then you have properties that are encumbered by these natural areas yeah. that you're going to lose anyway. And so, I mean, it just allows you to, you know, have a, looking at that square piece of property, I mean, you've got the floodplain on a quarter of it, yeah. which is hard to develop, you know, and saying that you can still have the same density as if <coughs> the floodplain didn't exist, but you're just moving it over and densifying it, yeah. you know, and still getting the same net, you know, that you would. If it, if it yeah. Exist. Yeah. It seems like it could open up some areas for development that it was fairly impractical uh -huh. before, but probably in a pretty decent way in terms of leaving hopefully what's important there and mm -hmm. and and making sure any development that does happen is taken up less of a footprint. Yeah, I mean, you think about any newer subdivision, we have so much earthwork that yeah. goes into it. I mean, there's just mass grading that happens, yeah. and maybe it could help to curb that to a certain extent of, you know, maybe they don't develop those steeper slopes and but allow, are allowed to, you know, put more lots on some of the areas that are more, you know, better suited for development. So. Yeah. Well, if it had been in place 100 years ago, it would have been nice to have a little 10-foot hog creek running <laughs> down North Polk instead of a <laughs> ditch on the side of the road. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I give it more the street is right in the middle of the creek. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so thanks, Mike. I, I, I think this is moving in the right direction. We'll just uh, keep working. I, I, I like the ideas that are coming out here. Um, you may have noticed in the agenda that a couple of our items have been moved uh, toward the end of the meeting agenda. For example, Reports, transportation, uh, which we won't do because Joel's not here. Unless, Mike, there was anything that you were aware of that... Uh, Nothing I'm aware of. And uh, the uh, where it says announcements, that's uh, what we've called previously correspondence. Any correspondence from... Uh, uh, noth yeah, nothing. Nothing. So anyway, I guess the, the, the new format is uh, kind of uh, causing us some changes that we'll have to get used to here. So anyway, um, if there is nothing else, uh, for the good of the order, uh, meeting is adjourned. And uh, Kurt, best of luck to you. Have a great sure. move. And uh, we uh, will look forward to hearing from you. 50,000. Hmm? 10,000. 10, <laughs> yep. Yep, and it's been